like I'm an awful gambler. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Stuff that dreams are made of. Hey, gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. One morning, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I don't know. I am big. It's the picture that got small. Go ahead. Make my day. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Hello and welcome to Front Row Classics, a production of the Front Row Network of Shows, where we take a look at some of the greatest films ever made. And here's your host, Brandon Davis. Well, hello to everybody out there in podcast land. This is Front Row Classics. I'm your host, Brandon Davis. And uh, we've got a very special episode for you today. Um, Coming up um, this year is the 70th anniversary of I Love Lucy and... uh, I got a very special guest with me to talk about that and a lot of other things. Um, It's a wonderful conversation. I'm talking to the legendary Lucy Arnaz, um, daughter of Lucio Ball and Desi Arnaz, of course, but much more than that. Has had her own wonderful legendary career on the musical theater stage and, of course, for six seasons, co-starring with her mother on Here's Lucy and everything in between. She's an Emmy Award-winning producer and uh, a lot of great projects coming up for her down the pike to deal with the 70th anniversary. We we begin the first half of the interview just talking about her and her life and talking about growing up and talking about the theater and all of that. And then we... Uh, we move on to uh, just talking about a couple projects that are coming up, and she hints at a couple of other things, and so a lot of wonderful delights coming up for you here in this interview, and uh, it's uh, it, it's a really good one. So I'm excited for you to hear it, and we're just going to get going. So here we are with our interview with Lucy Arnaz. Well, it is my pleasure to welcome to Front Row Classics Lucy Arnaz. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Brandon. Oh, thank you so much. I've, I have I told you off air, I talked to Kate last year and we had a great time. And so it's a thrill to get to talk to you this time around as well. Great. Let's go. Let's awesome. do it. Awesome. When I, <laughs> well, when I, uh, when I talked to Kate last time, um, I got a tell you you know part of our conversation dealt with you know just what was going on in the world at the time and here we are still a year later Next still season. and how how have you all been dealing with this like the rest of the world no better no worse i mean luckily we're we we're good we're healthy we made it through uh we made it through to the vaccine era we've uh-huh. all been vaccinated we've uh, most of our friends are good and I know a lot of people um, who I'm not that friendly with, but who I'm associated with who did get COVID and we're in the hospital and on ventilators and thank oh. God we didn't lose any of them. Uh, but it's been crazy. You know, I, I, there are people in my family who uh, still don't think they need to get vaccinated. And it's really hard for me because what do you say to them? You don't want to, you don't want to say you have to, but you want to, you want to do that, you know, and um, yeah. I've been out of work doing my concerts and what I normally do for almost 17, 18 <sighs> months now. And I've never in my life, that's probably the hardest part about it, because I'm very busy with other stuff. And there's a lot of, sure. like we'll talk later, a lot of estate things and Desilu 2 things and all that, which is great. Thank God for that. Right. But I have never gone this long since I was, I don't know, 12 without doing something creative, without being involved in a, in, in a show, singing, dancing, mm-hmm. learning lines. So that it's, it's bizarre. I, I've not experienced this before. And I didn't realize it until about maybe five, six months ago that it was really starting to freak me out. I know. I'm, I'm, I am involved in community theater and the arts and I direct shows and I'm in shows as well around here. And it's, yeah, it's, it's just crazy. I know it's, it's just something that you, you always know that you long for it, but until you don't have it, it's like, man, just, it's like a part of you is gone. Well, there's one thing when you realize it's your career Mm -hmm. and you travel and you perform and you get a paycheck and you come home and you buy groceries and you know, this is what you do. But even when it's not about the money, you think, oh, wow, I just miss doing the doing of it. I just miss uh-huh. the actual performing. And yeah. I'm looking forward to getting soon. It's coming back. You know, it it's going to take till after the holidays, though, really, for me yeah. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, I know here's here's hoping that uh, things take a turn around and we get some kindness and common sense back into our world. Wouldn't that be nice? People, <laughs> let's just be nice. to Can't we all just get along? I know. 
I know. Well, let's uh, let's move on to uh, happier things, though. I, uh, I I mentioned before, you know, one of one of the big things that we're going to talk about is the uh, I Love Lucy 70th anniversary and other things that go along with that. But first, I just want to talk about you and uh, and your life and um, what what I find interesting, and I'm sure you get asked it all the time. So I'm not going to ask it. You know, what was it like? You know, growing up in in the family that you grew up in. But what I what I would like to ask, though, is was being an entertainer always in the cards for you uh, growing up in the environment that you did? Or was there some other path you might have been interested in at some point? Or was it always going to be show business? Well, that's an excellent question. And if I ever write a book, it's probably going to start with that. Like, was this what I was always supposed to do? <laughs> it started so soon, really, Brandon. I mean, in my, my current concert show, I talk about how did I get here? What am I, how did this all start? And I, and I think really from the time I was about eight years old, I have had a, a good time, let's call it. It's been fun for me to pretend to be other people and jump up on a coffee table and lip sync to a record. Or, you know, I was always kind of doing that little entertainment thing. Is it a combination of what I saw my father do on stage with his band and singing and, the, and then turning around and realizing I had another family member, my mother who would act out and, pretend she was somebody else, probably. That might have had something to do with it. I saw how much fun they had doing it. And that probably gave me a very early sign that this could be a good thing to go into. This is this is fun. Uh -huh. When I got a little older, I wasn't sure I could make a living at it, you know? Uh, and my plan was to see, to go to school all the way up through college, graduate school, and get trained as well as I could and go give it a, give my best shot. Before I could do that, my mother changed her a series, you know, episode format and asked my brother Desi and I to be on the new show. And it really threw me because I was like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I can't. But I made the choice to try it. Maybe that will be an education too. And funny, it worked. And six years later, I was still there. And then I went directly into summer stock and regional theater and then a touring company, first national tour. And I never looked back. I was like, oh my God. I guess, I guess this is what I'm doing for a living. And I couldn't be happier. It's, it's my bliss. It's what I love. Yeah. So I'm a fortunate, very, very fortunate person that I can be in a profession that I absolutely adore and, and make a living doing it. I'm, I'm blessed. Oh, absolutely. And uh, would, would your parents have been encouraging if you had decided to go into another field? Yes. I think my mom and my dad always said they just wanted me to do something that made me happy and didn't hurt anybody else. It'd be good if it made me super happy and was super helpful to everybody else. Uh -huh. And I think what I ended up doing is is both of those things. Yeah. You know, they just wanted their kids to be content and happy and safe, like any good parent, right? That's what right. I say to my kids. Yeah. Yeah. And and of course you went the uh, musical theater route, which was different from any other member of your family. Was that a conscious decision to try and do something outside of what the other three members of your family were doing? It's possible. It occurred to me after I was there that that was a good thing. I said, oh, look at that. that's interesting. I'm in theater. And at least that's all mine. Desi was in music, my brother, you know, and then movies. Uh -huh. And my mother was primarily television. My father was production and television and music, bands and singing and records. And nobody was a theater person. And um, it's where my heart was from the very, very beginning. I, I created a little theater group in my backyard when I was about 11, picked my high school because it had the best drama department, musical drama department. So I guess I always knew I was headed there. And even after I was on the Here's Lucy show for all that time, uh, Vivian Vance, my mother's best friend mentor, uh -huh. my mentor said to me, you know, you, you have to, you got to get out of here every once in a while. You got to get back to the stage. You love the stage. I know you do. And I was like, well, yeah, I, I will. No, 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 no. Otherwise, you're going to get typecast as this little chinky Benitz on this, you know, <laughs> situation comedy show, and you'll never get out of it. You'll just be that person. And I was like, well, that's a crazy thing to say. I mean, look at you. You were, oh, that's right. You're Ethel Mertz for the rest of your life. You can't go back and do Medea tomorrow. You know, oh. they're going to look at you funny. And she was giving me very good advice. So I, that's when I just said, okay, when I have free time and I'm not on the television show, I'm going to go back and hone my theater skills. And I was so happy that I did that because then I was ready when the show stopped. I was ready to, to just keep going with theater and I've never looked back. 
when when you first started out and it you know time came to audition and all that stuff you know you you had such a wonderful start in show business and when it came time to actually um you know audition and make your way out did you feel like that there were two people who were entering the room with you at the same time you heard me say that didn't you you read that in an article somewhere i must I have that, i must that, have <laughs> i said that exact thing i've been quoted as saying that that yeah you can't really be anonymous and that's the that's the hard part of getting the leg up and also having been on a tv show already um you can't you can't just go into an audition room and fail and learn from your failure and just be an anonymous you know person who didn't get the job you walk into a room and a the image of your mother, your father, whatever, both of them sort of comes right behind you, you know, as you're in there and they think about it probably the whole time you're performing and singing. And, you know, it's, it's not, you can't just learn. If you don't get the part, you can't go, well, that's okay. It doesn't matter. They go, oh, you know, that was Lucy and Desi's daughter. And so, so. You know, it's, it's harder. So yeah. I never got really good at auditioning. I thought I better get really good at acting and doing my job so I don't have to ever do this auditioning stuff. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> I really hated it and I'm not that good at it. But so, you know, I'm, I'm, the few parts I've gotten through auditions, I thank my stars because it's a very tough thing to do and, uh, and even tougher if they already know who you are, you know? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And well, I, I got to tell you, I, it, it was during, it was when the pandemic started and I just started listening to a bunch of different um broadway cast albums on um on my amazon playlist and everything and i started listening to they're playing our song and i hadn't really i knew i knew the title song but i hadn't really listened to the whole score before sorry uh, no you're fine and uh let me tell you i, I i'm in love with the score of that show and it, isn't it's, it a fabulous it is a fabulous score Mar it's, marvin hamlish carol bayer sager marvin hamlish carol bayer sager and it was it was sort of meant to be a Neil Simon send up of pop music, but, mm -hmm. but Marvin's never going to do that. He's never going to make something that doesn't work just to get a joke, you know. So that music was really fun, and it was so much fun to do every night. I mean, I still put the album on, and I can't stop singing. I listen to the whole thing all the way through and sing it in my car or whatever. I do a lot of it in my show. I I think that you know, for its time, it was pretty classic and i i i love that people still remember it and say what you just said happy to that was my first broadway show can you imagine you get your first debut on broadway and you're working with neil simon and marvin hamlish carol bayer sager robert moore directing and manny eisenberg producing it. it's nuts at the imperial theater where my father did his first broadway show which was too many girls mm -hmm. so yeah very fortunate again <laughs> when you're when you're working with you know, big, big talent like that. And, and, and all in one room was it was that show a very collaborative process? Yes, in the most wonderful way. I have worked on a lot of shows since then. Uh, brand new musicals, which is of Eastwick, you know, whatever, and revivals and everything else in between. And I it's not that's not always what happens. Let me just say that yeah. that isn't always the scenario. And, and there's a lot of egos involved. And I don't know, it can be touchy a lot of walk on eggshells to get what you need. That was not the case at all. As a matter of fact, the biggest people, let's say the Neil Simons in the room, they were the ones to step forward and say, if this scene isn't working, it must be because of the writing, I'm gonna fix it. Mm. You know, it was never like, what are you doing wrong? That's not working. And Robert Moore, rest his soul, is um, was just a spectacular director, so much fun to work with. He, had, he actually directed my husband on Broadway in Boys in the Band. Mm. and. Um, so we had we had a history too, but no, there was none of that. It was an absolute joy, from beginning to end. I, I it's I'm astounded to say that, but it it totally was. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Can you can you even, and I'm sure you can't, but could you even put into words, you know, what you, being in a big Broadway hit like that is? I mean, when 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 you're mm -hmm. when you're in it, I mean, it, does it feel like a roller coaster? Well, I was very young. I was 27 at the time, I think, and uh, had never had to do a show for that long. First of all, I did it. Well, I did a national tour, but that was six months. And I thought that was long. And then you do regionals a couple of weeks, maybe it's four weeks, five weeks, something like that. But this was a year and a half on Broadway. And I just felt like Cinderella at the ball the entire time I was there. 
it was it was a, a joy. It was hard work. I mean, you are you got to live like a nun most of the time, but sometimes I didn't because <laughs> I was young. And I would, you know, people would come see the show and they wanted to go out afterwards. You go, yes, we'll go. With and then you're constantly going, wait a minute, what happened to the voice? Hold on. You learn very quickly. Can't do that. Uh, I mean, just before I did their playing our song, I was out in Massapequa, Long Island at the Jones Beach Theater doing Annie Get Your Gun for the entire summer mm. in Ethel Merman's Keys, mind you, oh. outdoors <laughs> with the elements and all of this. And I was should have learned by then, you know, you, you you have to take care of your little muscle here in your throat, girl. You can't smoke. You can't drink. Really, you know, you got to get your rest. And then I went to Broadway and I stayed on that as much as I could. But it's very seductive because the people that come to see your show and come backstage and invite you to go to Sardis, it's just too good to be true. And it's that's the hardest part, not just doing eight shows a week and you know, doing people say, how can you do eight shows a week over and over? Same thing over and over and over again. I said, well, you go through valleys, you know, where you think that's it. I can't dig anything else out of this part. I've done it. And then a week later you go, oh my God, that's what this scene is about. That's where the heart of this scene, which is, I love that. I mean, that's when you know you're a real theater person, when you like that, mm -hmm. doing it over and over again, making it better and better. Robert Klein, not so much. He was, um, <laughs> He was a stand-up comic, is right. brilliant, you know, brilliant stand-up. And um, as, as brilliant as he was in the show, I don't think, well, he, I, I know him and I've known him all this time. And so he would tell you, he didn't like that at all. He just wanted to talk to the audience. He didn't want to be up there talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't, he really didn't. He wanted to be talking to the audience directly, like, the, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Sure. And, and he did not particularly enjoy the repetition, the sameness uh, night after night even though in his club act, it's all written and he does the same routines again and again, but to him, he can switch it up. If he wants to say something different, it's on him. He can switch it up. Can't do that. Can't do that in a Broadway show, you know? Yeah. You all did a uh, 40th anniversary reunion yes. a couple of years ago. What was that like revisiting Oh my it? God. Goosebumps, incredible. Uh, I can't believe it actually happened. I have a friend named Robert Greenblatt who ran NBC for a long time, HBO, you know, Warners, and now he's uh, Lionsgate. He's just a mover and shaker of the highest order. And we were having lunch one day here in Palm Springs. And, and he was saying, oh, you know, in a couple of years, it's going to be the 40th anniversary of they're playing our song. That's my, one of the first shows I ever saw. I love it. And what, what, what's the plan? What are you going to do? And I went, what am I going to do? But it's February 11th, uh, 2019. I, th I have a gig in Key West with uh, Randy Roberts, who's going to be in drag doing his show. And I'm just, <laughs> show. Literally, that was my plan. That was true. And I love Randy. It was going to be fun, you know. But uh, he said, well, why don't we do a 40th anniversary? Why can't we make that happen? I went, oh, well, maybe you want to try to make that happen. And he did. He just made those calls and boom, we even had Ann Roth who did the original costumes came back and helped me create something to wear because it was going to be a one night, one, you know, staged in front of an, an orchestra, no sets, and you know, just the bare minimum props. Of course, in that show, it's very prop heavy. So, yeah. but somehow we did it. Chet Walker, who I had just worked with in Pippin came in and direct choreographed it, directed and choreographed it. And we got Robert Klein and myself, Debbie Gravitt, uh, who was Debbie Shapiro at that time. Now she's Debbie Gravitt, uh, was in it again. And Hugh Pinero came and played one of the guys. It was spectacular and it sold out. We couldn't go to the uh, same theater because there was something else was playing there and we couldn't use their stage. Mm -hmm. We were right next door at the Music Box Theater and we could have done three or four nights. That it was, It was that popular. But it was a once in a lifetime. We'll never do it again. Beautiful, you know, twenty-piece orchestra. It was great. It, it, you could hear a pin drop when we were doing the scenes, and at the end, the for every song, it, you know, it was like being for me. It was like being in the Rocky Horror Show. It was like <laughs> there were such fans out there and, ah! and screaming, and yelling, and hollering. It was just lovely. I'm so glad we got a chance to do that. That's great. That's great. And you you mentioned Pippin, and uh, I, rem I, I remember seeing footage of you a few years ago in that, and you uh, talk about always trying something new. You had to uh, master the trapeze for that, I believe. The dance trapeze, not the kind you swing through yeah. the air and leap from pole to pole. It was, you know, the, the trapeze bar went up about 25 feet of, of the, above the stage, which you don't think is that far until you get up there. 
oh my God. And I know no nets, no wires, no nothing. Me and this incredible acrobat. And we would go up and then I had to stand up on the bar and then get down and then crawl backwards and hang upside down. And then he's holding me just by my waist, just by my pelvis. And I do the bird thing with the, and singing at the same time. Yes, I learned how to do that. I was in my mid sixties and I can't believe that I did that. I, I, I'm so proud of myself for saying yes and taking it on and saying, why not? Let me see if I could. Do it. I trusted that if four other girls who had been in the Broadway show had been taught how to do this, that I could also learn it. And uh, they said, you know, just do what we tell you to do every day for three weeks. And we didn't have any extra time. It was the same three weeks everybody else in the show had yeah. to get ready. I had to get ready with all my songs and the dances and the, the lines as well and and learn this trapeze routine and you can't practice at home <laughs> so like when I learn the choreography I can make a tape and I can write down the thing and I can go home and do it all night long till I learn it I, you can't rehearse the trapeze thing by yourself so mm -hmm. yeah but that was pretty spectacular that was the uh, first national tour playing grandma in that acrobatized version of Pippin was spectacular and that's a great role because you come on you sing and hit a home run and you get off yes <laughs> and that was a great role even before when it was you know little irene ryan yeah. in the 70s doing it she stopped the show but now in the middle of this big number you get to go up to the <laughs> middle of the ceiling you know and hang upside down <laughs> and you get this thunderous applause and go like thank you bye-bye see you next time uh, yeah but but i'm also in the rest of the show irene in the original, it was not in the rest of the show. Mm -hmm. She only came out for that one number. This new version has grandma at the top, as you're in the entree act, you do your song, you're at the end, you know, so it was a full night, uh, but the one spotlight number was that one. And that was some number. Man, and you you only did Broadway with that for a couple of weeks. You toured with it mostly, a didn't month. you? I did it for a month on a Broadway. Month. Yeah, I was in the tour and uh, uh, Andrea Martin, Andrea. who did it on Broadway, had it in her contract that during, if there was a national tour, if they went to Los Angeles, she wants to have the right to do it in LA because they always want the you know casting directors and the producers yeah. to see it. I understood that. But um, <laughs> at one point they said, so you'll just stand down for four weeks. And I went, excuse me? I don't stand down. What's gonna happen to those you know arms? And, yeah, and they went, oh yeah, you're right. Can't just stop doing the trapeze for a month and then suddenly jump back into it again. So they said, okay, well, we'll put you in the Broadway show. So you'll do that for the month that she said, oh, I get to go to Broadway and do it? Fabulous. That's great. Priscilla Lopez was not too thrilled because she was doing the Broadway show at oh, the gosh. time and they told her to go stand down for four weeks. Wow. But you know, that's showbiz. Yeah, it is. Did, uh, when you were doing Pippin, did you notice, has, is there a big change between how Broadway was when you first started to how it is now, or is it pretty much the same, just bigger budgets? Hmm, that's a good question. I'm trying to think in which ways it would be. Yeah, well, the tickets are a hell of a lot more expensive. <laughs> that's for sure. You know, it's crazy to think what it was when I was first on Broadway. I remember when when Liza Minnelli was going to do her her first show, the Liza, whatever the first Broadway show that she did, they said tickets are going to be twenty five dollars. No one's going to pay that. Yeah. <laughs> I think our tickets were like twelve ninety five. Yeah, um, when we did, they're playing our song. It's incredible. But <laughs> you know what? I don't know. The only thing I can think, let's see, Pippin. Those I, no, I I was gonna say in some shows that I've been in, not Pippin, but some shows I've been in on Broadway, off Broadway. There's this thing where not everybody has that the show must go on kind of Ethel Merman, Carol Channing attitude that I was raised with. Mm -hmm. It's more like, eh, it doesn't feel so good today. I think I'm good. there were a lot of people who had their understudies going on an awful lot of the time. Mm. And on the tour, I noticed that a few of our cast members were just too young and stupid, like I was when I was 28, you know, 27, that they just went wherever we were in whatever town we were in, they're going to go find the, the clubs and they're going to drink and dance. And sure enough, they're only doing three shows out of eight of these people, you know? Luckily, we had good understudies, but I didn't understand that too much. And maybe that's how show business has oh. changed. But on Broadway, it's still pretty freaking fabulous. Being gotcha. on Broadway, there's nothing like it. Except the only difference is on Broadway, the, the rooms are much smaller. <laughs> mm. Some of those theaters, like the Music Box, like the Imperial, yeah, 
the rooms are teeny. It's just, every, everybody used to just crowd into these little spaces years ago and they have never been able to really make them any bigger because there's no space to, to drive that. There's nowhere to go, you know, but um, it's, it's, not a, it's not that much different. I still, I would go back in a minute if I found a show I wanted to do as much as I wanted to do Pippin. And I had just moved to Palm Springs with my husband. This was our third act. We were very happy here. I'm doing my club acts. I don't need to do a Broadway show and it's a lot of work. And it's not that much money. I can make a lot more money doing other things, right? Mm -hmm. But the temptation, once I had seen that show and saw that part, I was like, oh, I have to try this. So I'm not all that tempted to go back again and leave here and go back to New York for eight shows a week for something that I don't love as much. But that doesn't mean I'll never do it. I just have to find something that I care about as much. You know? Sure, yeah. and that's and that's what I've always seemed to notice about you. Where uh, you, you know, with the upbringing that you had, you could have had, you know, this sort of easy ticket with a TV career. But you did the things that you loved to do. You did more of theater and stuff. Although with 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 raising kids, was that difficult having to tour around and do all that? Well, that's kind of why I went to more concerts and less. Mm -hmm commitment to long tours and as the kids got older they're in schools you can't drag them out every five minutes you know and take them with you so in the in the first few years yes i could do that and then i thought you know i make some different choices here so my father passed away in 86 and i started listening to his music and it to me it just seemed like the best of both worlds like oh god if i could be in front of a big band like that in front of an audience same thing it's live there's live music it's live audience but you can sort of pick and choose how long you want to be gone Mm -hmm. You know, you can go out for two weeks or a week or one night. You don't have to leave as long. And that suited our family a lot better. So I did a lot more of that, although like with Witches of Eastwick or, you know, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Lost in Yonkers, uh, Pippin. I, I did succumb to the showbiz bug one more time. Do you uh, do you enjoy? I, you certainly seem to enjoy the nightclub and do the uh, oh. that that kind of performing. Is is the, the the intimacy? I'm sure that that's what the big draw is, isn't it? It's singing. It's getting yeah. a chance to sing the great songs that were written and with an um, amazing arrangements. I have a, a spectacular musical director that I usually work with, Ron Abel from New York. When he's not with me, I'm with Billy Stritch or I'm with uh, Ted Firth or I'm with Michael Orland and they're all like top of their, you know, top of, top of their lineup of musical directors. Nobody's, nobody's better. They're just some great musical directors. And I just find that incredibly entertaining for myself. I, I love music. I love singing it. And uh, I, I, I enjoy, it was hard in the beginning. I wasn't sure because I did start out as a theater person, you know, fourth wall, you don't talk to the audience and nor in television. So in the very beginning, I had to get used to, wait, I'm Lucy Arnaz. I'm not Sonia Walsk. I'm, I'm not Bertha on a trapeze. I'm Lucy Arnaz and, and I, now I'm gonna sing and then I'm gonna talk to you people. And that took some getting used to and now it feels very natural. And uh, I mean, I watched my dad do it and who was better than him? He was fantastic on stage uh -huh. with people. So, so it helped. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I just, I just like doing it. I like, I like, even Carol Channing used to tell me, she's, it's called a concert, Lucy. It's concert. <laughs> we don't say nightclub. We say concert. <laughs> it's supposed to be more prestigious or something to say that. But to me, I went to see Sammy Davis Jr. do his nightclub act. I went to see the Brat Pack in Las Vegas, Wayne Newton. They were doing nightclub acts. They weren't doing concerts. They were doing nightclub acts. And to me, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And I didn't think there was any shame in calling a nightclub act. But now I, I see, if you say I'm going out and I'm doing my concerts, it seems bigger. It seems like a larger stage, like more people will be there. The lighting will be better. Concerts are better than nightclub acts for some people because a nightclub act could be in some little dive bar somewhere. <laughs> it's like yeah. not, it doesn't have to be the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas, you know, it's like. But to me, it's all the same thing. I am of the cloth of those people. That's those mm. are my folks. I love those people. Absolutely. And also, you're uh, you're married to another actor, uh, Lawrence Luckenbill, who's a fabulous mm -hmm. actor. And uh, how how has that been? I mean, I mean, you grew up with two show business parents. Did the, did you sort of use that as sort of a do and don't for your relationship with your husband? Yeah, you've done your research, haven't you? I know you've done. Your I <laughs> 
these are familiar <laughs> topics. Um, yeah, it, it's very difficult when you're working with somebody in show business because again, his uh, schedule is helter skelter. There is no, mm-hmm. there's no, you know, reasonable like you can't say mom and dad are always home from monday through friday from this time to this time and we can see them i can make plans no because this week i'm doing this and next week or i'm not here at all i'm on the you know it's very very hard uh to be two working parents i don't care if you're both actors or whatever you're working all the time you're working all the time that's hard one of us could not always be there we had great help we had great people with our kids and no complaints about that but when they were about six, eight, and well, four, six, and eight, we decided that that wasn't going to be good enough, and we seriously had to give some thought to one of us always being there, you know, mm-hmm. one one blood relatives being being home in the house, and we can't both be gone. So we did. We changed everything to make that work for them, and it did make a difference. It made a huge difference because otherwise, you just don't have that bonding time with your kids that you mm-hmm. totally need, or they don't learn what it's like to parent, you know. I know that's what happened in my household. They did this wonderful job and this wonderful show that's going to be around forever, probably. But it was tough not to have them there. It was very tough. Things I did not learn how to do and didn't learn how to respond to in the way that a seasoned mom would, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, if I could go back, I would have changed that. Yeah, sure. So we have to be very careful because the kids, they must come first, but we wouldn't be people who were happy in our own skins that we weren't doing something we loved too, working in some capacity. Plus it's the way we make our living. It's how we earn our keep, you know, that's what we do. We wouldn't have this house kids if we weren't doing the show. (laughs) So uh, it's a balancing act and not an easy one. I I gotta tell you, it really isn't. And a lot of people think they can have it all. Oh, we can do this and do this and have kids and have a career and think, yeah, 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 you can. But you have to think about how are you gonna change how are you going to slot them in? You know, how are you going to make time for these kids who really need, you know, give or take 10 or 15 minutes, just that alone with you every day, Sure. every day, every kid in your house, we have five kids. So it was a lot to get that done. Right. And I'm not so sure I did it right all the time. Ask my kids as you talk to Kate, I'm sure she was very polite when she talked to you. Don't call her today though. It could be an entire story. (laughs) She was very good. She chose her words very carefully. (laughs) (laughs) We did the best we could as they all say. And it's the truth. Yeah. Are you, uh, are you thankful to have been um, to have been an entertainer in the era that you were? Because uh, I, I, I'm trying to think. Because you, I mean, I mean, you were brought up in a certain kind of show business, and it continued a little bit in the '70s and '80s when you were working constantly. Because you know there was still that kind of old vaudevillian sort of feeling yeah. about show business, still because TV specials, which we don't have much anymore, movies of the week, things like that. Um, do you feel fortunate that you were around during that time where you could be so versatile? Here I go with the gratitude again. I do feel fortunate, very, very fortunate. Um, television was just being born in the 50s, you know, mm-hmm. and even actors or nightclub acts, concerts were kind of young. Yeah. You know, in the 40s, the 50s. I'm, you know, I, I was there at a time when that talent, those folks who came up through the ranks and really knew what the heck they were doing was legit talent. You know, it, there were no Kardashians or anything. There were people mm-hmm. who actually had the talent that got them where they were and the Sammy Davis Juniors and the Dean Martins and the Sinatras and the Hopes and the thing to be around them and watch them do what they do. And, and not only watch them do what they do, but talk about what they do and the ethical uh, mindset that most of them had. And I was in it, I was right in the middle of it. And I could soak all that up. I wish I could give that to some of the kids today because there, there is, the business has gone on for you know how many more years with 45, 50, 50, 60 years since I was in that mix as a kid. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, that's a long time. So the business has gotten, it's much more mature. So there's many, many more performers, more shows have been on, more, more things have happened. And I think there is a, there's kind of a race to, to get in front and, and get yourself a name real quick somehow. 
plus we've been thrown the monkey wrench of Instagrams and accounts. And so it's now about how many likes you got, mm -hmm. which is probably the worst possible thing that could have ever happened to show business performers ever. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, it's great to have a little phone where you can, you know, put pictures of yourself and have people see you do sure. stuff. But if it depends, you're, if you're being cast in something, depends on how many followers you have on your Instagram account, that's kind of crazy. And yeah. you don't even get an option to go in to see these people because they don't have the time or the, they don't want to publicize you. They don't do that anymore. They want you to do it. They want you to do it on your social media platform. Mm -hmm. I am so glad that is not the way it was when I was at, you know, at the height of doing my shows and getting jobs. It's, there were always press people who you met, whether it was a play or a TV movie or a television series or a feature film. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm the press person on this thing. And you're going to, will you do interviews? And we, sure, of course, blah, blah, blah. Now you go to do a show and they go, oh, by the way, we don't do any press for this. You'll have to promote it by yourself on your social media. I'm like, mm -hmm. Seriously? Seriously? You're not even paying me that much. And you want me to do all your promotion too? And the young kids coming up today, that's what, that's all they look at. That's what they look at. How many people, and they think likes means like, which is also a self, you know, self-esteem issue. Mm -hmm. Not that many people like me. I know. It's a, it's a weird thing. So uh, that's something I'm glad I didn't have to live through, yeah. you know, right now. It, it just, it seems to me when I, uh, being a fan of that era of show business my whole life, like I have, and just been fortunate enough, it just seems like that this particular era, the joy is gone in, in performing. It feels like everything is so, I, I mean, fun is still there, I guess you could say, but there just doesn't seem to be as much of a joy in performing anymore, I, I feel like. I feel like it's all for, for, for approval of others, as you were saying. Well, I don't know if I agree with you 100%, okay. because as you said that, I, I am envisioning so many people that I know. Sure. Primarily, my, my brain went to the people on Broadway stages. Uh, mm. Because I think in order to do those shows, those rigorous routines and schedules, eight shows a week, uh, you have to pretty much love what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but I know what you mean. I, I know that a lot of the times it's for the end result is more important than the actual doing. And you don't really enjoy the work as much. We were talking about that just this morning, actually, about um, the truncated rehearsal periods on some of the three camera, quote unquote, three camera live audience shows that they do today. It doesn't seem like as much, even as it was in the early days of Mary Tyler Moore or early days of Friends, where you're really working Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it's just your little group and you perfect and perfect and perfect. And then the audience comes in and you do I've been hanging on some sets over the last 10, 15 years. I'm there for whatever reason. And I don't think they, a lot of them didn't seem to work as hard. They, they seemed to want to phone it in more. And it was more about the perks, like their dressing room. And they had people, oh, there were so many people. Everybody had an assistant and an associate and a, you know, someone to hold their this and their that and get them their Starbucks. And it was all like diva, diva, diva. That is not like it was. It wasn't like that. We were actors, you know, especially on Broadway. You don't get any of that. Like, <laughs> yeah. excuse me. This is a place where you put yeah. your own makeup on, you know, unless you're wearing a wig, you're doing your own hair and you're, you're doing the grunt work and you got to do it again tomorrow. It's not all over. And they're going to go print. That's it. Thank you. And we get to watch it for the rest of our lives. No, no, no. You're doing it. And then go home, get sick because tomorrow you're going to do it again. And you do it because you love it. But a lot of people don't like hard work. A lot of people don't want the work. They just want the result. And uh, it shows sometimes. It shows in an attitude. The quick, Give me the quick uh, fix. I want the house and the hill and the big car. You know? now, now, what was the experience like on Will and Grace when you when you were on it doing your little Well, I was, the, I was just there, you know, briefly. Because, again, okay. they didn't really shoot it. Well, at least that particular week might have been weird, right? Because I don't think mm -hmm. it was the same way every week on that okay. show. They were doing something quite unusual. They were trying to match, you know, shot for shot, the show, the original shows that they were taking excerpts from, which was quite an undertaking and, and you know, uh, bless them for liking the show so much that they wanted to have that kind of fun with it. Um, but yeah, I could tell that things were quite different than, than the way we used to do what we did. We didn't keep our audiences so long. They were there for hours. Oh my God. And they did multiple takes, take after take after take after. They'd be right in the middle of a take and you're not doing it again because something fell or somebody went up. That happens too, much more than it used to. 
but you're doing it again because somebody on the floor, one of the 47,912 producers came up with an idea. Hey, wait, let's do it again. Now the scene was perfect. They captured it. The audience was laughing amazing, but some person decided it would be funnier if when she came through the door this time, she's holding this. So we're gonna do it again. Uh. Seriously? <laughs> Seriously. I don't get that at all. The people who created the sets, the costumes, the makeup people, the hair people, the props people, oh my God, they were fantastic. I mean, they just went out of their way to celebrate and tribute this show to the best of their abilities. They all were huge fans. And Deborah, you know, she tried really, really hard to bring uh -huh. Lucy Ricardo to life. She truly did. She gave it her all. And I wouldn't put anybody in that position, put just no. put them in the middle of vitamin to vegemin. You just can't. You can't. Mm -mm. We're talking now about an idea for this coming year to celebrate the 70th anniversary. And it's something quite dangerous and really out there. And if it isn't done right, it can look like a bad gimmick. But if it's done right, it's going to be incredible where we don't do that. We do the, the polar opposite of that. You don't try to recreate any of the performances you saw before, but you take the exact situation, the scripts, the original scripts, uh -huh. and you recast it with some of our finest people today, and you shoot it the way we shot it, you know, Monday through Thursday. Sure. Same exact way. And celebrate the actual heart of what I Love Lucy was, which is the words, the, the situation, yeah. the writing. My mom and dad always said, it's our writers. If it wasn't for the writers, we wouldn't be standing here because those people were astounding. And there weren't 27 of them on the, on the set every night <laughs> while you're trying to film saying, wait, I have a funnier joke. Sit down. <laughs> the show's frozen. <laughs> the shows are good. Shut up now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, you. It was, uh, it was, I was honored, and and my yeah. part in it, it was very cute that they wanted me to play, you know, the the, the chocolate factory lady, um, El, El, oh, the Alvina. What was her name? Elvin. I forgot how Lucy. Terrible. I forgot the woman's name. Uh, Elva, Elva. Last name was Alman, I think. Um, Elva, Elva Alman. Something like that. Yeah. Elva. She was remarkable. <laughs> no one could do that better than she did. So already, uh, <laughs> how could anybody expect to do vitamin to vegemin or the chocolate factory scene as my mother? as well yeah. if i didn't even want to take on her part because that already was iconic just yelling speed it up a little and all that stuff yeah i was like no no my god but it but it was to me it wasn't it wasn't like trying to recreate it per se it was really a, a salute a little tribute a little fun thing like a dream sequence almost yeah yeah, yeah. well the, you mentioned the the 70th anniversary of i love lucy is this year and it is. um <laughs> what what do you think your mom and dad would think it would still be around 70 years later? Not at all. I, I, I think they are absolutely blown away by this. I'm sure, I'm sure they know because I get a lot of help with what I do just when I need it. Uh, with what I do with the estates and you know the licensing and all of that stuff, their ideas this past year have saved my butt, literally, because there was you no know, nothing to do. I couldn't go out, do my shows. And uh, mm -hmm. it's been rain and Lucy for you know sure, two yeah. years. So it's coming out of the woodwork and it's all wonderful, just wonderful projects that I generally don't put my whole soul into because that, wait, I'm the actor. I'm the, you know, this is what I do for a living. I don't do that. But when yeah. I couldn't do it for a living, I went, all right, put the hat on and do it and do it really good, yeah. do it really well. And uh, I'm very proud of what's come out of that. Mm. Yeah. Well, and I, I can imagine, I mean, having a career of your own, but also having to be the caretaker of your mom and dad's legacies, that's yeah. a balancing act. Yeah, well, you know, Desi and I looked at the responsibility early on and we could have easily turned it over to some big conglomerate as they do people, Judy Garland estate or whatever, they have a big office run. They didn't, they just say, send me the check, you know? <laughs> I, I couldn't see that happening. I wanted to be closer in on, no, 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 no. What? You're putting her face on what? No. And so we've been keeping it pretty close, you know, to the cuff. And um, and I think it's been good. We've been able to, this is a piece of property, like a piece of real estate. And you just want to make sure that the land is still valuable and that they aren't building slum, you know, apartments on it. Yeah. And 
I'm proud of what we've done. And there's even more stuff coming up that will be better because Good. the older I got, the more I started to say, hey, I've just been sort of letting this happen. Yes and no, yes and no, but I haven't been directing the brand or uh -huh. what direction we want to go. What, what do we want to do with this? We have, this is a lot of big stuff. What do we want to do with this? And now we are looking at it like that. Good. And I have to say, one of the reasons that that happened was because of my daughter, because of Kate. When I started to bring Catherine Luckenbill into, Catherine Luckenbill Connor, Kate Luckenbill Connor, uh, into some of our meetings, because I said, you know, someday you may have to deal with all this crap and you need to know what it is. Okay, mom. I said, unless you really don't, then I, no, 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 I'm curious. Uh -huh. So I brought her in and very quickly, she was making some wonderful points and, and asking some great questions. Why aren't we doing this? How come we don't have a presence here? Why don't we do that? And it really turned us around and got me thinking in a completely different direction. And now three years later, um, a lot of great stuff uh, has percolated, you know? Well, one, one project that I really have fallen in love with is the Let's Talk to Lucy uh, podcast series. And uh, yeah. my, uh, well, first of all, my dad, who uh, grew up with you um, watching Here's Lucy when he was a kid, that's all he listened to in the car for weeks and weeks and weeks. And so I, I listened to them with him and then I'm listening to the podcast every week. But to me, it's so fascinating. I Isn't mean, it? it's, you're, it's incredible. Your, your mom pioneered yeah. the podcast. <laughs> Well, she was certainly one of the first ones. She, Arthur Godfrey, maybe, and mm -hmm. you know, one or two other people. I knew these things existed. I'd had them for years and years in a in a box in a in a storage unit, but they were reel to reel tapes. You know, there was a show. I know she did a show in the mid sixties. She interviewed people. I never heard any of it. I don't think. I don't think I even heard it then. I was twelve or thirteen. I don't mm -hmm. think I even listened to it, and so I had no idea who who those people were. And um, we're in the process of doing yet another project a documentary on mom and dad now that Imagine Entertainment, Ron Howard's group and Whitehorse Pictures is putting together, Amy Poehler's directing it and it's been bought by Amazon Studios. And when they started researching this and I decided that yes, we could get involved and help them. I loved the idea of what they wanted to do with it and the direction and her point of view, Amy's point of view and everything so much that I pretty much opened up everything except you know my linen closet to this woman. Yeah. And we saw these these tapes you know and what are these and i you know i don't know let me let's digitize these and find out oh my gosh 240 episodes and sometimes they're three and four five parters some mm -hmm. of them but they're 10 minute interviews and it's you name it the people it's dick van dyke mary tyler moore frank sinatra barbara streisand danny k uh steve allen edith head hedda hopper Carol Burnett, Carol Channing, I don't, I don't know, I can go on all night. It yeah. just, it's the, the best people that existed at that time, plus a few people that are just in strange sort of side jobs that even her talking to them was fascinating about yeah. life. She was a phenomenal interviewer. She was. She really was, who knew? She I was, was I, really I was like, like you, she was interested in her people, she oh. would delve, through the questions and go a little deeper when she'd get an answer back. Oh, no, no, wait, wait, tell me about that. How'd you do that? Yeah. And, um, and you're, it's like being a fly on the wall in a very intimate conversation with some of entertainment's biggest historic names. Right? I was, li I was listening to the episode with Red Skelton the other day yeah, and they're, they're talking about, they're talking about gardening and then they go into a whole talk on spirituality and it was oh, just yeah, fascinating know, right? to listen because to. She almost never, like their show people, they don't want to, talk about what's your new movie i mean once in a while she would say that oh i hear you just did funny girl barbara <laughs> you know hello <laughs> yeah. like she, barbara was 23 at the time and she's on broadway doing funny girl but normally they didn't talk about promoting something they were just talking about life and kids yeah. and marriage growing up and how do you deal with that and oh my god what was it like for you when you were first starting at the studios well i heard you had a terrible time you don't get this kind of information about these people anyplace else. So oh. yeah, it's, it's addictive. That's the best word I've come up with. Totally. She, yeah. She, she is somebody, and I've, um, I've also been listening to um, the, the autobiographies of your parents on audible, you reading your mother's and then Juan Pablo de Pache reading your father's. Yes. Thank and you. they just, I don't know. You, it, you're with your mother. It's like, I would love to, 
sit on a porch with her on a Sunday afternoon and just pick her brain. Yeah. And then, and then with your dad, I would just, I, I'd love to just be in his presence because he just seems like such a lover of life. Uh, just, just everything. It's so, and, and listening to Juan Pablo, it's almost like the spirit of your father was coming through him. I could just hear it in his voice. And, and he just seems like such an amazing human being. It was, and you're absolutely right. You, you, you nailed him perfectly. <laughs> He was wonderful to spend time with, and he was just naturally witty. He he didn't do jokes like, "Hey, did you hear the one about the guy that you know?" He he was just he just saw things funny, and I think I get my sense of humor from my dad. Believe it or not, mm -hmm. my mother was the actor comedian. Like, she, give her something brilliant, and she'll spin it into gold. Mm -hmm. You give me good writing, I can turn this into something amazing. Yeah, and she had the best writers, and that that combination was magical. Um, and yes, you could sit on the porch and she probably would not enjoy being, have her brain picked and ask a lot of questions. She was, as you can tell from some of the interviews, you know, she had a pretty hard edge to her sometimes. And uh, I've been, what I've been listening to recently, which is the next thing to put out there uh -huh. on our channel, if we have a full on Lucy channel next time, uh -huh. is uh, she did these master classes, these seminars in, out in uh, Northridge. Oh, and wow many hours of her answering questions and she, <laughs> she did not suffer fools easily let's just say that no. you know if the questions weren't deep enough or didn't you know like we're here to help you i'm here to help now no one's asked me a question today about you know what are you asking me that for what the hell do you want to know about that for? <laughs> oh my God. When, when she does stuff like that though it, it, it it's never personal to me it never comes off that way it's just no. her you know no, she she had she had absolute uh, ideas about how things should go. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, she developed a stamp for this and this and this and this. And once it got stamped that, you're not gonna change that. And that's the way she's gonna run her life. And that's her belief system. And she's gonna tell it to you. And very rarely would somebody tell her something and she'd go, oh, you know what? I see what you're saying. You're right. That's actually, I almost never heard her do that. She's like, no, no. And a lot of the time she was right. You know, they were, mm -hmm. they were uh, original, pioneer, simple values yeah. about certain things. And yeah, well, of course, those radio shows were done in 64, 65. So it's kind of a time warp if you listen to some of it, because you know, it. Our, it was way before women's lib or anything like that and feminist movement. And you could tell we weren't, we weren't as woke as we like to say in those days. Um, but that's kind of great too, because you say like that's where we were, and then we had to yeah. go through that, and you know the Vietnam War was like percolating, and all that stuff was going on. Mm -hmm. It's kind of amazing, but it's honest. Yeah. yeah. Well, I tried to channel her voice and her attitude as much as I could when I read the autobiography. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, it usually says on the Audible books it says uh, read by the author or read by Lucy uh -huh. Arnett. When I saw the book, it came out and it actually says performed it by does. Lucy Arnaz. And I went, oh, <laughs> that's weird. You're right though. In a way I was performing it. I wasn't just uh -huh. reading it because I, I kind of can hear her voice in my head and I wanted to make sure that I got as close to what I thought she would, how she'd say it as I know she did. This, how to ask this question, but would, were they both aware when they were still with us, were they aware how beloved they were? Um, were, were they aware just the, um, I, I mean, I'm sure they felt the adulation from people, but I mean, I mean, uh, it, it'd be hard to even just process how, you know, I, the, you know, it absolutely is, loved you are by the world. I think so. I think it is hard to comprehend really. You can, you can know it and you don't really know it. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, we're a big hit and my show's a success. I've been number one or whatever. And the fans will come up to you and, you know, with every mouthful of food you put in a complete, could I sign it? You can't go anywhere without being crushed, you know, and there's all that. But it didn't seem to weigh on them heavily. I mean, they knew it and they appreciated it, both of them. They always were extraordinarily polite and kind to all of the people who uh, said that they, wanted to talk to them or uh -huh. wanted an autograph or we we so appreciate you told them stories of how I Love Lucy had changed their lives or the other shows that they had done uh they were very elegant and and uh, I don't know they just were pretty uh 
genuine with their fans and, yeah. and they taught me to be the same way. I think I am the same way. I appreciate all that adoration. And I think they did. They did understand how beloved they were. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, another project which has been in the news lately is the upcoming Being the Ricardos mm -hmm. uh, movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I loved the video that you put on social media after the big, ever, everybody lost their minds when, <laughs> <laughs> when it was announced about Nicole Kidman I playing know. your mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, you made it very clear in the video, you know, you know hey, voting is over. I love that line. That you said. And P.S. The voting is <laughs> over. Bye bye. Well, the thing was, I think a lot of people just automatically assumed, and they didn't even know the title of it then. They just knew there was a movie mm -hmm. coming out, right? Being the Ricardos is a little confusing because it sounds like you're going to be doing a reboot of I Love Lucy. But he had a reason for calling it that. And when you see the movie, it'll become clear. But um, it's not I Love Lucy. We're not redoing I Love Lucy. It's a story of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz and their life together. And yes, Aaron Sorkin, the remarkable Aaron Sorkin, has decided to tell the story within a framework of a week of rehearsing one of the I Love Lucy shows, not one of the iconic ones, just an episode. Uh -huh. And they hardly get into costume and be Lucy, Ricky, Ricardo, or the Mertzes at all. There's very, 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 very little of that in the movie. The rest of it is them dealing with being who they were in 1953, top of the you know charts, Lucio Baldesi Arnaz, and with their marriage and trying to deal with all the other stuff that came into their life during that week. It's a very, it's a very busy week, he wrote. And, and you do feel like you get a sense of what it was like to, to film one of those shows in those days, early television, the beginning of television. Uh -huh. And uh, you get a very good sense of the character of Lucille Ball and of Desi Arnaz. And I think of William Frawley and Vivian Vance too, and all the, and the writers and Jess Oppenheimer, because I was there, I know all these people, and he yeah. did a good job of that. We worked hard to make sure that it wasn't exaggerated or, you know, people aren't, don't come off in a light that isn't true to them. Um, and most of it's pretty, pretty accurate. Uh, he does take some theatrical license here and there, and I try to talk about a couple of things, and I think he finally figured that out. But, you know, uh, that's what we do. That's what we do. We, we argue to get things right so that the movie can make sense. Having said all of that, I only was on the set for two days uh, uh, watching Nicole film a couple of the, the um, flashback scenes. So she was playing my mother in the 30s, the early 40s. I have not seen one single piece of footage from the rest of the movie yet, but Wednesday, I'm gonna see the first rough cut. Oh, wow. I know, I'm very excited. And uh, from what I saw, I think it's gonna be amazing because what I saw was first class, everything all around. Everything, just top of the, top of the line acting from every single person cast, uh -huh. from the biggest parts to the tiniest roles. The set and the costumes were all Academy Award winners who wanted to work on this because they loved the idea or they wanted to work with Aaron Sorkin. So I think it's gonna be, it would be really hard to screw this up with this team. <laughs> You know, Javier Bardem playing my father. Oh. He doesn't look like my father at all, unless he smiles straight on and you see the dimples and the, that wonderful face. But, you know, his profile's not the same and his mm -hmm. face shape is a little different, but he's Javier Bardem and he can get in my father's heart better than mm -hmm. anybody. Sure. And Nicole doesn't really look like my mom that much. It was Kate Blanchett for many years. She was going to play the part, but it took mm -hmm. so long to get this thing off the ground, believe it yeah. or not, that Kate went on to other projects. And I was very sad to see her go. But Nicole is this amazing performer who can play pretty much anything. I've seen her do some of the best work yeah. ever. And I'm confident that she has crawled into my mother's skin in a, in a very respectful and, and professional and accurate way. I'll be very surprised if after what I saw those two days on the set, that this is suddenly gonna go left, you know, it's suddenly gonna go off track. That would be pretty hard. So my feeling is that I'm, it's going to be amazing and people are going to be really excited to see this little, it's a little snippet of their lives. It is not a biopic. It's not a cradle to grave story at all. Uh -huh. We kind of thought we were going to do that originally, yeah. but Aaron wasn't interested in doing that. And we went, all right, you're Aaron Sorkin. Let's see what you can do. Yeah. You the, well, the, 
the biopic has been, you know, so prevalent lately. It's nice to see when someone takes a spin on it. So I'm excited to see. And that. we have the documentary that we just spoke yeah. about, and that will be a biopic. So, and that right. I didn't know that that was going to be in there at the time. There was no documentary. There was only this movie. Mm -hmm. it took six years, and then in the last two years, just before COVID hit, actually, mm -hmm. we were approached by this magnificent team to do a documentary. And they do want to do the whole like cradle to grave, like what the oh, hell good. is going on? Who are these people? <laughs> How did this work? And I did a documentary, you know, 1993, yeah. I produced yeah. a documentary called yeah. Lucy and Desi Home Movie. Emmy winning documentary. Thank you. <laughs> and I thought, we don't need to do this again. There is this <laughs> fabulous documentary out there already. But then I thought, no, it's look at this group. I mean, this group should get a crack at this. They, I want to see what they do. Mm -hmm. I'll bet it's going to be a whole other frame of mind and questions. I was coming at it from a daughter's point of view, right? So right. Amy Poehler is coming at it from, you know, a woman's point of view, a mother's point of view, a, an actress's point of view, a celebrity point of view, and a damn good director's point of view as well. So yeah. I can't wait to see what, what they do with that. I can't either. Will it be out next year? Is that what yes. they're thinking? And okay. actually, when Amazon Studios, who bought the feature film, the Aaron Sorkin project, uh, when they heard about the documentary, <laughs> they were like, what do you mean there's a documentary? <laughs> and instead of um, trying to stop it or anything, they actually bought it from Ron Howard. I'm sure he, he made a pretty penny. They liked it so much, they bought it. And I said, oh, sure, they're buying it to shelve it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not competition, but that's not true. We're going to, uh, you know, co-market the two and one will be on first and then that'll be like a partner thing afterwards and they can cross promote each other and like I said, it's raining Lucy. It is. It's if amazing. You're on your I... water faucet right now and probably get something that has to do with these people. That's great. Yeah, I'm and I'm looking forward to all of it. I tell you, um, Lucy, I we're we're slowly uh, running out of time here, but oh, I can't. I, I but. <laughs> but, but I still I got a couple just uh, other okay. questions I wanted to uh, sort of conclude the interview with. And I know I know you get asked all the time, like favorite episodes and stuff. But do you have an episode of I Love Lucy that you think is the most underrated? That oh, doesn't God, get talked so about enough? There's so many. Um, I just spent, <clears throat> excuse me, I just spent about three weekends and I'm talking, my, my butt still hurts because I sat through this whole thing. <laughs> Looking at episodes, episodes, I don't do that. You'd think I do because they're my folks. I don't look at I Love Lucy episodes. Sure. Oh, they, I, I bump into them all over the place. And I've done 50th anniversary clip shows where I've had to see all the elements of them. But I don't sit there and watch them day after day. I watched 40 episodes because I wanted to pick eight for this 70th anniversary show that we're talking about. Re redoing in a way with uh -huh. the script and oh my god there's so many and that was the whole point how many other good ones are there other than vitamin of Benjamin, you know chocolate factory grape stomping the ones everybody mentions all the time yeah and even the pioneer women with the bread coming out of the oven the ones you remember oh i remember that but if i listed a whole bunch of other ones you go oh yes oh my god it's just that nobody talks about them so uh -huh. we found the other oh yes oh my god ones you know and are there, more? of course, there's a gazillion of them. Um, the freezer where she buys too much meat and she has, to, mm -hmm. she has to stuff it all in the freezer and then it burns and the thing. The ballet with the teacher and she had to do Abba, Abba on the ballet ball. <laughs> you know, the queen of the gypsies one. With that's this, my favorite, is. the operetta. That's my I favorite. I mean, there's, there are shows that the whole show might not be as funny as the one moment you remember, mm -hmm. but there are other shows that really are. And uh, those are the ones we were looking for that were, they're like actor proof. They're so good. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there are lots and lots of them so that I can't even say yeah. I have a favorite. I, I, I have a special place in my heart for the one where Lucy and Ethel hitchhike to Florida and hitch a ride with Elsa Lanchester, who they think yes. the hatchet killer. Yes. <laughs> the two of them are hysterical in that. Right. And of course, if we do this, we're going to stick with the ones that took place probably on the New York yeah. City set. So they sure. have a hundred Oh, yeah. But there's, yeah, they, it's, I really did a deep dive and I was amazed. I was like, oh mm -hmm. my God, this is, I forgot <laughs> how much stuff is here. And yeah, yeah. and now they're out on <clears throat> DVDs and people can, you know, flip through them and watch what they want when they want. Cause it's not that easy to find on, on network television. It's not out there. You have to get it, pay for it sort of, you know, yeah. 
Paramount Plus, or CBS All Access, Hallmark, yes. Hulu, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's a little harder to find, but the DVDs are out there in its entirety, yeah. and that's great for people too. Yeah, and uh, the entire series of Here's Lucy is on Prime, um, which yeah, uh, how about that? which I love. Do you do you have a favorite episode of Here's Lucy? Oh God, yeah. Is that like a favorite? I love, child? All, I love all the musical ones. Mm -hmm. I was so thrilled and lucky to be able to do so much music on that show, and I learned to tap dance and do all kinds of stuff and it just got better and better and better and better. Mm -hmm. So there are moments in, in those shows that I absolutely love. I mean, I love the one I did with Frankie Avalon where we did Sonny and Cher. Sonny, yeah. That's pretty fabulous. Yeah. And uh, there, there's a lot of big dance shows. The one with Ruth Buzzy when we did the Hot Ginger and Dynamite, that, you know, back in Nagasaki when I did the mm -hmm. big tap number that was all done in one take, jumping up wow. on the bar and tap dancing and sliding down the fire pole and I think done next, let's go. Boom. Those things are memorable, you know. There was, there was a great video that went viral last year of you, your mom, and oh, Ginger yeah, Rogers, Ginger and they Rogers. and they underscored it with single ladies. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> that was pretty fabulous. Yeah, that's right. That's the kind of people I got to work with, right? Yeah. Ginger Rogers. And we had to do that show in two days because there was an actor's strike looming, and we suddenly decided, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Should we just cancel? No, no. We have to do the show. We got to do it right now. What do you mean now? The audience doesn't come in until Thursday. Too bad. We're going to rehearse it today and shoot it tomorrow. What? And so Ginger Rogers and I choreographed that number in about three minutes. So wow. Yeah. wow. Well, well, here's something. Uh, here's Lucy. Like 75% of the episodes, I feel like each have a major guest star um, in the episode. So, um, and I, I've heard you talk about this before, but when you talk about your mother's professionalism, um, uh -huh. did, did you find that um, certain guest stars came up to that level and others didn't, certainly? Yeah. I mean, yes, you get to learn from all different kinds of people. You learn what to do, what not to do. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say there were very many people who didn't come up to the professional level there, you know, and I won't even mention names like yeah. me. Family. I won't mention. <laughs> I won't say that, but there are certain people who just come on and they're just rude to people and they blame other people and they don't know their lines and they're just complainers. And you know what I learned about that? I don't care. I don't, I didn't dislike the person for the rest of my life, but I thought, geez, look what this does to the whole vibe of the week. And we go, everything is so much slower and it's not fun anymore. And that's what you learn. Don't be one of those people. Take the whole damn company down with you, you know? And, um, but yeah, there was a, a guest star a lot on that show. And um, so I got to learn not only from what their talent was, but from also how they approached the business, you know, the good, mm -hmm. the bad, and the ugly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one, one of the things um, also that I wanted to talk about just listening to uh, your dad's life story is uh, what an amazing cook he was. Did you have a favorite dish that he made? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I loved when he would have, we would have some big event, like maybe it was Christmas or she would give a big party at his ranch and we would do the, the roasted pig, pig on the spit, mm. you know, literally dig a hole in the ground like a luau and roast the pig for, you know, 16 hours, whatever it was all day long. And that was amazing. He was a fantastic uh, original cook. Like he got the real stuff, you know? And then he made a great arroz con pollo and uh, black beans. I didn't like black beans when I was a kid though. He, he tried to get me to eat his black beans and rice and I was like, ooh, 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 daddy, no, <laughs> get that out of my face, ugh. Because it looked awful. It looked, it looked, I don't want to say what it looked like. <laughs> and, uh, it did. And I was like, I'm not eating that. And then he passed away and I'm much older. I'm in my thirties and I, somebody gave me a wonderful Cuban cookbook. And I thought, I'm going to make these black beans and see what they actually taste like. See if I can do that. I mean, I don't know. So I made a small amount, you know, oh my God, they're so good. And it was so delicious. I got tears in my eyes and I just felt so bad that I hadn't <laughs> even given him the, you know, the pleasure of seeing me taste mm -hmm. one little spoonful while he was alive. Well, I'm too mean. So now I'm a pretty good Cuban cook because I got a great cookbook and I really love making the puerco asado and the mojo criollo and, you know, the plantans and all that stuff. We do it all the time here. Good. Are you, uh, are you ever planning to do the Latin Roots show again at some point? I hope so. Yeah, I hope I so. It's not the easiest show to take around because it's a big band mm -hmm. and not everybody wants to pay you enough money to pay for a big band. But I can't do that show, the Latin Roots show, without the real orchestra, my dad's orchestra and everything. And it's a, you know, that the Latin Roots is not like the Babalu show that we did at the Library of Congress and we did at 92nd mm -hmm. Street, you know, Lyric and Lyricist. That was totally my dad's arrangements, all about him and his life and how he made 
his how he got into show business. Latin Roots is, a, is really a celebration of what I grew up with, that music, and how it influenced the music I do today. Sure. And so I, I would do that show everywhere if I could. I would love to have a sit down and just do it in Vegas for, you know, a month or something somewhere. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful show, and I'm very, 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 very proud of it. Good. You mentioned you, uh, you live in Palm Springs, and there seems to be a big performing arts community there. How, what's it like being there? Yeah, there is. There is. I, I mean, that's one of the reasons I felt okay about moving here is I had visited a lot of my friends from Broadway. David Zippel, wonderful, uh -huh. you know, lyricist is here. And a lot of my favorite musical directors live here. And Suzanne lives here and Barry Manilow lives here. And for quite a while, it was Kay Ballard and Carol Channing and, you know, lots of other people, Keely uh -huh. Smith. And we've lost a few of them over the years. But um, there's a mindset of people in this community where no matter what your business is, even if you have to get on a plane all the time to go do your various work, this is where you want to perch. This is where you come home to because it's so, the word I like to use is doable. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to be here. The people have a big heart and the mountains have a big energy. And I just feel good when I'm here. It gets a little hot in the summer. I can imagine. But, but you know, it gets a little cold in New York in the winter. So, yeah. you, you know, it, you'd give up one for the other. We do our barbecuing in December. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> we can't we can't barbecue Christmas here in Illinois. Exactly. So we... <laughs> no, I just flip it and I'm, then I'm good. Uh, how's your brother doing? Fine, thank you. Thank you for asking. He's, you know, he's a self uh, reclaimed, self claimed hermit. He likes to be home and uh -huh. take care of his theater that he owns in in Nevada. And um, but he's he's okay. He's fine, and he, he sort of lets me run the business end of this, but I keep him in the loop all the time. He knows what's going on and, and, uh, and he's a good person. I love good. him. Yeah. Good. He's a good guy. He's not working, doesn't do his music really anymore. He, he plays some drums when I can drag him out of his house and get him into my show. He'll do a whole percussion thing for me, which oh. nobody's better. So. Yeah, that's another fun. Listening to the uh, Dean Martin episode, hearing Dean and your mom talk about the Dino, Desi and Billy. Yes. So that was <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he's still very good friends with Billy, who lives not far from him in Nevada. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish that they had continued on with that. They started doing Ricky, Desi, and Billy for a while, but then Ricky Martin, Dino's younger brother, passed away as well. Yeah. And then l my brother unfortunately lost his his wife six years ago mm. uh, to brain cancer, which was just horrifying and horrible. And he's never really, you know, wanted to come out of that joyfully he hasn't come out of that yet really uh -huh. uh, but you know he's doing the best he can good he's a good boy good good to hear yeah. well lucy i want to um i just want to conclude with um th this question what what attribute of your mother and what attribute of your father do you still carry with you mm. in life? oh geez well it won't be just one thing so yeah forgive me if i try to just narrow That's it fine. down I got a lot of good stuff from both of them. Um, if I start with my dad, what I tell people is that he very, they both were very practical, both of them, very practical advice. And my father used to say things all the time. Maybe Katie must, might've mentioned this because I've passed it on down to my own children about if you don't know what to do, don't do anything. She mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, and I would say, what? And he'd say, you know, you just, I'm saying, you know, when you're not just a, a simple decision, like, I don't want to know what to have for breakfast. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what to do with this, whatever it is. I've looked at it this way. And I just, I, and I got to make a decision. I just don't know. And he goes, you don't know what to do. Don't do anything. Means uh -huh. you don't have enough information yet. And whatever you do right now is not going to be good. So you got to go back to the drawing board, look at it a different direction, get some more, get, go back and, and research it some more until a few little pieces will drop into the puzzle and you, and then you'll know, you'll go, oh, okay. Oh, okay. 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 Now I understand what that, oh, I'll take a shot on that. Because then even if it doesn't turn out the way you thought, even if it's not perfect, it's not going to be bad for you. It's going to be a learning experience. It's going to be a stepping stone to what you needed to find out in order to get to the next step. You got a great way of looking at life that way. And he would say, you know, uh, one wave at a time, not one day, but because he was a, he liked the sea and he had a boat and he learned how to sure. drive his boat. And they always used to say, hey, Desi, one wave at a time, just figure out how to get through this one. Then you get through the next one. And he ran his life like that. So I, I live by those as much as possible. And my mother, I mean, there's more, but my, my mother had a way of 
as you can tell from the radio shows, if you listen to them, taking care of business, take care of Lucy, mm -hmm. take care of your health, take care of your finances, take care of your house, make sure you're at this, make sure she was a list maker. And I think a lot of it came from being so responsible, so young at a young age, her father died, and her mother had to go up back to work and she had to take care of the family. And she was like six, you know, and suddenly she's having to have all this responsibility, you know, shoved on her shoulders. So she became a very, very, maybe even overly responsible person. But there's some good stuff in that. I am a terrific organizer, list maker, producer, accomplisher, you know, gatherer of facts and, and problem solver. And I think that comes from a, my father saying, look at it all these different ways. And, you know, there must be a way. That's the other thing he said, and you will hear it in his book. He used to say that all the time. There must be a way. There must be a way. There must be a way. Mm -hmm. And he would go to find it. Whatever he wanted to do, he'd say there must be a way. I mean, right now I'm trying to solve the, the terrible debacle, which is known as the Salton Sea here in Palm Springs, which is, has no, not enough water in it. And they're not, there are no more tributaries coming into it. And so it's like a, a bowl being out in the sun, slowly oh. disappearing. The okay. water is slowly evaporating. And what's happening is it's getting so salinated that the fish and the, all the birds and everything is dying and the toxicity in the water is, going, well, this has been going on now. They've been complaining about it for 20 years. 20 years, nobody's wow. done diddly squat. And the other morning I walked outside and it stunk. It's hot here right now and it's very humid. And when that happens, the salt and sea smells just go like, and it's like, ugh, like rotten eggs. Uh -huh. And I thought, I don't want to live like this anymore. What is this? And I started researching it online and watching documentaries. And now within two days, I put together a, a group of people who have indeed been fighting this and making a little progress and then not. And, you know, people, you know, Republicans and Democrats, it's really not about that. It's about bureaucracy and people taking money. Yeah. From the and I'm bound to have no idea how to fix this, but there must be a way. There must be a way and I'm going to find it. Yeah. Yeah. So he said that, and I love that. And my mother would just say, take care of Lucy, take care of your health, do what's good for Lucy. Like, you know, put yourself in a position that's going to take care of you because you can't take care of any of this. If you get sick, if you, you know, are too tired, if you're run down. And I appreciated that because she's absolutely right. She learned that the hard way. She got sick for yeah. many years at one point and couldn't function, you know, uh -huh. as a young person. So responsibility, organization, uh, and creative thinking is what I like to think I, I took, have gotten from mm. them. Fantastic. Lucy, as well as an ability to slam a lot of doors and scream very loud. <laughs> Ask my children. But other than that. Well, that's good too. We... <laughs> it is what it is. It is what it is. Awesome. You are who you are. Yeah. Well, Lucy, this has been an absolute treat talking to you. And uh, you. I, I, I thank you so much for doing this. And just, uh, I told Kate this last time I did it, but just, uh, you, you know, this might be the only chance I get, but just thank you so much to your family for the joy you've given to me over the years. And um, your, you know, your, your parents, you, your brother, you helped sort of define my sense of humor, what I find funny. And um, it's Good. just... It's, it's, it's joyful and we need some joy right now. So uh, yes, we do. We need a little joy, a little love, a lot of mm -hmm. kindness, a lot of patience with one another, put yourself in other people's position. Mm -hmm. Just remember we're all alike. We all want the same things. Listen to David Friedman's song. We can be kind. Mm -hmm. Look it up. Google it. Well, we can be kind. We'll do. If people want to, once you're able to start performing again, um, where's the best place to find where your concert dates are and all of that? Well, LucyArnaz.com. L-U-C-I-E-A-R-N-A-Z.com. My calendar on that is, we try to keep it up to date. Recently, it's had a lot of canceled things going through it, but uh, we start up again in January. I go to Memphis in January for one night at the, Orf at the Orpheum Theater, uh, doing my, sh my one woman show called I Got the Job, Songs from My Musical Past. And then I go to Einstein's 54 Below New York with the same show for four nights, January 19th through 22nd. And then I don't know what's happening until April down in Florida, Crest Theater in Florida for two nights, Aventura the next night. We're slowly trying to rebook all the things that got canceled. Sure. Yeah, so, but it should be up on my website. And if it's not, you can contact me there too. There's a thing that says contact Lucy. And uh, I do answer my mail. Oh, 
Very nice, very nice. Well, Lucy, once again, thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me and it was a pleasure talking to you, Brandon. Thank you, you as well. All right, be safe, everybody. You too, have a good one, okay. bye. Well, there you have it. What a wonderful, wonderful um, experience to be able to talk to uh, Lucy Arnaz. And uh, it's just absolutely wonderful to be able to uh, get to hear some of these stories firsthand and get to hear her perspective on show business and on life even, just like uh, her mother does on uh, Let's Talk to Lucy. If uh, And I encourage you, if you have not listened to Let's Talk to Lucy, you can find it wherever you find podcasts. And believe me, it's uh, it's worth it. It's nice, wonderful little time capsules to uh, listen to. And uh, of course, can't wait for the Ron Howard documentary and being the Ricardos and whatever else they decide to uh, come down the pike. So um, oh, just our eyes are peeled for that. And so, yeah, I just encourage you all, like she said, just... Um, embrace the joy in life and uh, be kind to one another and uh, live out her her parents legacy of love and laughter so uh, that will do it now for uh, this particular episode um, a lot of great stuff coming up here you'll probably already have heard our episode on uh, guess who's coming to dinner which dropped which um, was uh, was a great discussion and then also coming up for the uh, month of october eric and i will be discussing um the wolfman and bride of frankenstein um celebrating october along with the rest of the front row for a monster cast here on npr illinois community voices and uh just a lot of lot of fun things coming down the pike so keep your eyes peeled um you know it's uh we're still living in some you know difficult times here but Hopefully, you know, we'll come out of them soon. And uh, until then, there's a lot of great stuff for you to listen to and enjoy. And uh, with the uh, holiday season coming up, as you know, a lot of fun, fun podcasts will be coming out from all of our shows. Flashbacks, Guilty Pleasures, um, Beyond the Mouse, our friends at the Beyond the Mouse podcast. So just keep your eyes peeled for uh, all of that. But for Front Row Classics, you can find us on Facebook, Front Row Classics Podcast. Um, you can email us at classicsfrn at gmail.com. Um, if you want to suggest a movie that we talk about or a topic, just let us know. You can find us on Twitter at FRN Classics and um, also find us on Instagram at FRN Classics Pod. So, uh, yeah, so still, still so happy coming off of this wonderful interview with Lucy Arnaz, but so many other great things coming up. So give us a listen. So once again, for the Front Row Classics, I'm Brandon Davis, and we will see you in the front row.